We're here with Randall Carlock, INSEAD professor and co-author of the recently published book, When Family Businesses Are Best. Welcome. Thank you. So tell me, when are family businesses best? Family businesses are best when the family uses their values and vision to drive all of their actions. The difference between a family business and a non-family business is that there's a group of people in a family business that own the firm, and so they're identifiable owners and they can stand for something. The challenge in large corporations is they're owned by millions of people, management changes constantly, there isn't a set of consistent values that drive their behavior. What about when they're at their worst? Uh, they're at their worst when the family doesn't plan and doesn't prepare. Um, the subtitle of our book is Parallel Planning, and what we say that means really is that the family has to plan for the business, like all businesses, but they have to plan equally well for the family. Things like participation, developing the ownership, a good board of directors, a good family council. Families have to do twice the work because they have to manage two systems. What about an outsider coming into that? Well, an outsider coming into it is, uh, has a very exciting opportunity, partially because you have the ability to think long term. You're not on this quarterly mentality that is what confronts most executives in public companies. We've got to make it in the next 90 days. Families think in terms of generations. The downside, and the, what you have to be cautious for, is that there's going to be politics, there's going to be sensitivities, and you really have to understand that you're not part of the family, you're a professional manager. And so in some ways, it challenges you to be even more professional. But don't you always feel like the perennial outsider? Yes and no. I mean, of course, you're not part of the family. But many great family businesses, one of the things they do is to create a level playing field and make the decision as a value that merit determines who leads this business. And so in families like Cargill, a non-family CEO has run the company for the last 30 years. The family ran it, but they reached a point where they said the best person to run this business is a non-family member. How common or difficult is that? It's not that difficult if you plan. If you don't plan, then it's just natural that one of the six kids is going to take over. Sam Walton did a wonderful lesson in family business. When he reached about $5 billion in sales, he went to his board and he said, I've started this, I've built it this far, but I want the best management team in the world. And he said to the board, let's find the best retailer we can to replace me. And then he went to his family and said the same thing. He said to his wife and his son, Rob, you can be chairman, you can be a great owner, but unless you are the best retailer in the world, hire somebody else. And that's the model. It's about meritocracy. So in that situation, a, a non-family member has a very exciting career opportunity. Now you yourself worked for a family-owned business. Can you tell me about that, which has now become the Target Corporation? Right. I worked for the Dayton family, which is one of the great family businesses in the United States. I didn't know it was a family business. I just went to university, went to work for them like all the other interns. And then I, a few years later, found out why their values and practices were very different, why they gave 5% of the profits back to the community, why, when I left them, their family office investment fund gave me money to start my own company. The kind of stewardship, they wanted good business in their communities. That was a very different mentality. They didn't see me as a competitor or as a threat. They saw me as an alumni, as a spokesperson, someone that demonstrated what their family stood for. What about differences in family-owned businesses worldwide? Well, we see a lot of differences in family-owned businesses worldwide. But they're the same in the sense that all families want to raise successful children and they want family to have harmony. They want the family to be connected. And so a family business is another glue to hold it together. In Asia, in the Middle East, and in a lot of Europe, family business is the established model, where in more Anglo-Saxon countries, the model was really established, driven by the United States, to go public. The United States had very small family businesses and went from that to large public corporations because we kind of leapfrogged stages of development because we exploded in growth at the turn of the century. Um, what happened in Europe was the businesses had a chance to grow up. What's happening in Asia is that you don't have markets for, for publicly traded companies like you do in the United States. And so most of the public companies in, the, in China or in Hong Kong or Singapore are controlled by families. The same in Europe. Of the largest 250 companies, uh, public companies in France, over 50% are controlled by families, starting with Louis Vuitton. And the same thing in Germany, over 50%. Your Volkswagens, your BMWs, those are controlled by families. 
And that's what makes a difference. But what happens when somebody wants to buy them? There's a trade-off among three factors. Liquidity, getting cash for the family, capital for the business, or con and control. If you get a lot of capital out of the business, you're going to lose control, and then you lose that kind of special quality that makes family businesses family businesses. Why they outperform, and financially, family-controlled businesses will outperform widely traded companies. Now, there's a tremendous study on the Fortune 500 that shows the ones that are controlled by families perform financially better. How does globalization factor into this? Well, globalization factors in a lot of different ways. It's a threat to some family businesses who, who want to compete only in their own home market, so they have to stay small. It's a real positive. Think, think Louis Vuitton. I mean, they're all over Asia, but I mean, they understand family mentality. They understand family business because they are one. How do family businesses fare during economic downturns? Well, they tend to, to fare a little bit better and then they fare a little bit worse in upturns because they don't lay off as many employees, they don't cut back on their capital expenditures, they can reduce dividends and do other things to weather the storm. They also aren't that sensitive to quarterly results. If I'm the CEO and I know that my family is behind me, I can take a loss and not shut down our plants, not lay off our employees, not stop our long-term planning. So when the economy turns around, I may have a little bit more expense structure. Right now, the United States, productivity is at a record high because they've laid off so many employees and sales are coming back. Family business is much stronger when it's long-term. Think about Louis Vuitton. They can't just get out of the fashion business for 12 months and say, well, we're not going to design any new things because the economy's bad. So one of the pieces that gives that brand such momentum is that the family invests at a constant level and is always trying to grow it no matter what the economy's doing. Look at the, look at the benefit that's had in Asia. What about advice for students at INSEAD who might have the opportunity to go into a family-owned business? First of all, take the family business course. And I tease a little bit about it, but it prepares you. People think that family businesses have problems because their father is difficult to deal with or their uncle is stubborn or whatever it might be, their cousin. It's not. Most of the problems are structural. It's the fact that families have a set of values and businesses have a set of values and those two don't mix very well. In fact, they don't mix at all. Families are about love and caring and self-esteem and businesses are about profit and change and growth and fighting. And families and businesses don't mix. And so you have to be what I call kind of emotionally professional. You don't want to give up your feelings. You don't want to give up your passion. But you have to be professional in how you plan to use it. So in, when Volkswagen and Porsche were fighting so hard for control of their combined companies, to me that was a plus. Because they were fighting, they wanted to make the most powerful car company in the world. And it was two branches, two sets of cousins fighting. That is a plus to me. Even though it was a fight, it was a fight for the right reason, to make the best car company in the world, rather than some other companies where they're fighting over who's going to have the most assets or, or whatever it might be. So given the option of working for a family-owned business or a non-family-owned business, you would definitely opt for the family-owned business. I would opt for working for your own family business. Start your own. Great. Thank you very much for being with us on NCAD Knowledge. It's fun. Thank you.